they defined the phrase sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But offstage, the members of Led Zeppelin didn't have it easy. From facing countless death threats to losing one of their own, tragedy seemed to follow the band wherever it went. Although he's now hailed as one of the most iconic rock frontmen of all time, Robert Plant once suffered from crippling self-confidence issues. Plant was still just a teen when Led Zeppelin first hit the road in 1968, and the screaming masses were too much for him at first. Critics weren't kind to Led Zeppelin, and Plant, being the face and voice of the band, often took the brunt of their abuse. After attending a 1969 show, John Landau wrote in Rolling Stone, I saw little more than Robert Plant's imitations of sexuality. Meanwhile, Rolling Stone's John Mendelssohn slammed his prissy appearance. The cruel words deeply affected Plant, who was already prone to self-doubt. In fact, band manager Peter Grant admitted to Barney Hoskins, author of Led Zeppelin IV, that he had to hide bad reviews from him. And as author Stephen Davis noted in his biography Hammer of the Gods, Grant sometimes had to comfort an anxiety-wracked Plant just to get him on stage. These issues, which also made him hesitant to write lyrics, caused band leader Jimmy Page to consider him the group's weak point. As a result, Plant was initially paid less than tour manager Richard Cole and wasn't credited in the band's first album. Following Led Zeppelin's 1970 tour, Cole noted in Hoskins' book, more than anyone, Robert seemed on the brink of collapse. I had always thought, there's another thing I can do, there's another thing I can do. But it's a terrible drug being a good singer. While touring America in 1973, Led Zeppelin partied hard in New Orleans. The band was staying at the Royal Orleans Hotel in the French Quarter, which was notorious for its rowdy nightlife. There, bassist and keyboardist John Paul Jones invited a person named Stephanie back to his hotel room, unaware that she was a drag queen, and calamity ensued. Jones and Stephanie had smoked a joint together and fell asleep before properly extinguishing it. The still-lit joint then ignited the bedsheets and started an inferno, prompting firefighters to break down the door. When they did, they allegedly discovered Jones and Stephanie unconscious and in varying states of undress. Robert Plant later immortalized this version of the incident in the 1976 Led Zeppelin song, Royal Orleans. But in a 2001 interview for Lemon Squeezings, Jones claimed that Davis's and Plant's accounts weren't quite accurate. He clarified that Stephanie was a longtime friend of the band, and there was never any confusion about gender. But what remains true is that there was a fire, and had the fire department not intervened, he and Stephanie could probably have died that night. Jones told the outlet, We were in our room, drinking, and probably fell asleep, and I found the room full of firemen. On July 29, 1973, Led Zeppelin became the victim of a bizarre crime. Just before the band's last of three shows at New York City's Madison Square Garden, Richard Cole opened the group's safety deposit box at the Drake Hotel and found it empty. One finds it very hard to comprehend that something could happen like that in a hotel of this, uh, so of this nature. Led Zeppelin had been robbed of over $200,000, a significant portion of their earnings from their tour of the United States. Not wanting to alarm the band before they went on stage, Cole tried to handle the matter as privately as possible. Nonetheless, the FBI showed up, and while the band performed, they thoroughly searched everyone's hotel rooms. The safe showed no signs of forced entry, indicating that whoever had swiped the money had used a key. Suspecting an inside job, they interrogated Cole and subjected him to a lie detector test, which he passed. After the show, they also questioned the band members but identified no leads. The robbery made national news the next day. Though he presented a bold, fearless presence on stage, Led Zeppelin's drummer John Bonham struggled immensely while on the road. A family man at heart, Bonham often found himself missing his wife and two young children, who stayed back in England when he toured. Early in Led Zeppelin's career, Bonham began drinking heavily to combat his depression and homesickness, which more often than not led to mayhem. A friendly and gentle man when sober, Bonham was prone to anger, recklessness, and violent outbursts when intoxicated. He frequently took his alcohol-induced rage out on hotel rooms and anyone around him when it hit. Over the years, this behavior earned him the unflattering nickname, The Beast. In Barney Hoskins' book, John Paul Jones had this explanation for Bonham's behavior. Bonham drank because he hated being away from home. He really did. Between gigs, he found it hard to cope. Touring also exacerbated Bonham's struggles with anxiety. He hated flying so much that he would often ask his driver to turn around when en route to an airport. He also suffered from constant pre-show panic attacks. According to Louder Sound, Bonham stated in a 1975 interview, I've got worse. I have terribly bad nerves all the time. It's worse at festivals. As their popularity grew, Led Zeppelin started playing bigger shows, which came with new problems. On July 5, 1971, the band played to a rambunctious crowd of around 15,000 people at a stadium in Milan, Italy. 
promoters implored the band to ask the audience to stop starting fires, which frontman Robert Plant did repeatedly, but to no avail. Things escalated, and hundreds of riot police used tear gas, water cannons, and batons to subdue the crowd, injuring many. Disoriented by the blinding smoke, the panicked audience rushed on stage, causing the band to abandon their gear mid-show and flee along with them. Amidst the chaos, one of the group's roadies was hit in the head by a broken bottle and had to be hospitalized. In When Giants Walk the Earth, Paige had this to say about the event, absolutely ghastly. It was just pandemonium, and nowhere was immune from this blasted tear gas, including us. I was terribly upset afterwards. Well, it's quite an experience, you know, and I'm still here to tell the tale. It was just the first of many dangerous performances. During the band's 1977 American tour, ticketless fans rushed the gates at multiple shows, resulting in hundreds of arrests. That same year, violent riots broke out amongst a 70,000-strong crowd in Tampa, Florida, when a show was cut short due to rain, leaving police outnumbered and powerless. Then, during a Cincinnati, Ohio concert, a fan fell from an upper level and died. While on a break from touring in 1975, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, and their families took a summer vacation to the Greek island of Rhodes. But on August 4th, tragedy struck. Robert's wife, Maureen, was driving a rental car on one of the island's mountain roads when she lost control of it, sending the car off a cliff and into a tree. Robert was thrown on top of his wife, shattering his right leg and elbow in the process. Meanwhile, Maureen nearly died, fracturing her skull and pelvis and later requiring a blood transfusion. In fact, her injuries were so severe that Robert initially thought she was dead. The accident also happened in a remote area, so the only help available was a local farmer who gave them a ride to the hospital in his fruit truck. Luckily, everyone eventually recovered. Robert's leg was placed in a cast that extended from his hip to his toes. He then spent six months in a wheelchair, after which he used a cane for another year. The traumatic experience changed him. According to Hoskins' book, Plant said, I know that my kind of vision, or the carefree element I had, disappeared instantly when I had my accident. That kind of ramshackle, I'll take the world now attitude was completely gone. Led Zeppelin achieved most of their success in the United States, and as a result, toured there 11 times in their 12-year career. But each tour came with new challenges. First, the band's married members were forced to spend months without their families, which took a toll on their mental well-being. It was anything but conducive to normal family life. And then there was all the American mayhem they experienced, which included trouble with police, Vietnam War-era civil unrest, violent audiences, and aggressive encounters with gun-wielding Southerners. Though originally enamored with the land of the free, the country lost its charm for the band quickly. As noted in When Giants Walk the Earth, John Paul Jones said to a writer after a 1970 tour, I don't think we can take America again for a while. America definitely unhinges you. Singer Robert Plant also became disenchanted with the States. According to Hoskins' book, he told the crowd at a 1971 show in Tokyo, America doesn't seem to be so good anymore, unfortunately. Maybe it'll get better. It didn't. By the end of Led Zeppelin's career, the partying had all but stopped, and U.S. tours had become a chore. Along with their immense popularity came some of the negative aspects of fame. Led Zeppelin soon had their fair share of both deranged fans and outright haters. This hatred led to a slew of death threats against the band. As Led Zeppelin's publicist Danny Goldberg noted in Hammer of the Gods, the threats started during the group's 1973 American tour and became commonplace after that. In fact, death threats occurred with such unsettling frequency that John Paul Jones once considered quitting the band over them. In one notable incident, famous Charles Manson follower Lynn Squeaky Fromm repeatedly tried to contact Page. And in another, a disturbed man was arrested for insisting Page's death was imminent. Things got so bad that Led Zeppelin started traveling with an entourage of bodyguards, including two former FBI agents, who accompanied them everywhere. Band manager Peter Grant also hired security to guard the elevators in the band's hotel floor. Page, who began suffering from insomnia, even had private security guards stationed outside of his hotel rooms day and night. None of the members of Led Zeppelin were strangers to the hedonistic rock star life, but some partied harder than others. Jimmy Page began using heroin around 1975, and over the years, this habit became a crippling addiction that rendered him weak, skeletal, and often sickly. He also became increasingly unreliable and erratic. After interviewing him in 1977, Journalist Dave Schultz described Page as remarkably thin and pale. That same year, a show had to be cut short due to Page's inability to perform. 
John Bonham also sank deeper into his addictions. In addition to regularly using cocaine and heroin, he began drinking heavily and engaged in increasingly aggressive and chaotic ways. Eventually, a rift formed in the band between Robert Plant and John Paul Jones, who both limited their drug and alcohol use, and Page and Bonham, who were beginning to spiral as a result of their addictions. In fact, the band's 1976 album Presence was recorded with the two groups almost completely isolated from one another, while 1979's In Through the Outdoor was pretty much created by Plant and Jones alone. Led Zeppelin's tumultuous final North American tour ended abruptly when Robert Plant received a life-changing phone call. The band had just arrived in Louisiana when Plant's frantic wife, Maureen, called to inform him that their five-year-old son, Carrick, had contracted a virus and was seriously ill. Just two hours later, on July 26, 1977, Carrick had died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Plant was devastated. The remaining tour dates were promptly canceled, and he returned home to grieve with his family. In Mick Wall's When Giants Walk the Earth, Robert claimed that 1977 was the year it all stopped for him. Speaking about his son's sudden and untimely death, he told Wall, nothing could make it all right again, and nothing ever will. John Bonham was the only member of Led Zeppelin who attended Carrick's funeral. According to When Giants Walk the Earth, Plant told tour manager Richard Cole, maybe they don't have as much respect for me as I do for them. Maybe they're not the friends I thought they were. He eventually attributed his bandmates' aloof behavior in the face of tragedy to cultural differences. He and Bonham were raised in England's Midlands, while Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones were from the South. Jones at least later made it up to him when the two co-wrote the moving ballad All My Love for Carrick. Every now and again, he turns up in songs, you know, for no other reason than I miss him a lot. In 1980, things seemed to finally be looking up for Led Zeppelin. Robert Plant, who nearly quit music after Carrick's death, had decided to continue, and the band was planning a long-awaited comeback tour, when tragedy struck yet again, this time from within. John Bonham's continued struggle with drug and alcohol use was no secret. In fact, he had collapsed on stage just three songs into a performance on June 27th. The band stated that his illness was food-related, but fans claimed he was visibly intoxicated during the show. Bonham had quit using heroin, but was still drinking heavily and taking anti-anxiety medication. He was also very apprehensive about returning to America. On September 24th, the first day of rehearsals, Bonham visited a pub. While there, he drank four quadruple-shot vodka drinks and ate a few ham rolls. He then continued drinking throughout the practice session, passing out when he became unable to play. He never awoke. His death was ruled an accidental suicide, affected by inhaling his own vomit after consuming around 40 ounces of alcohol. He was just 32 years old. Plant was especially impacted by the loss. He said in Hammer of the Gods, It was one of the most flattening, heartbreaking parts of my life. I had a great, warm, big-hearted friend I haven't got anymore. It was just one ridiculous loss. A tall and sturdily built former wrestler, Peter Grant was certainly an imposing figure, often considered the fifth member of Led Zeppelin. He ruthlessly protected and advocated for the band throughout their entire career as their manager. As a result, however, he was drawn into the violence, drug use, and general chaos of the music industry. This came at a great cost to his personal life. Frequently left alone in England with their children while Led Zeppelin toured overseas, Grant's wife Gloria became increasingly frustrated. In 1975, after 10 years of marriage, she left him. According to Louder Sound, Peter's close friend, producer Mickey Most, later explained, The split up with Gloria was like the final nail in the coffin. He was morally broken. He wasn't the Peter Grant we all knew and loved. He became secretive, and you felt uncomfortable around him. Bonham's death also affected Grant deeply, as the two were very close. Racked with guilt and sadness, he stopped working and became a recluse who rarely left his home. He was also diagnosed with heart problems and diabetes. By 1990, Grant had managed to quit drugs, lost a significant amount of weight, and briefly returned to the public sphere. But unfortunately, his health problems had finally caught up with him. On November 21st, 1995, he died of a heart attack at age 60. The surviving members of Led Zeppelin decided that without John Bonham, the band simply couldn't go on. Indeed, the remaining members have played together as Led Zeppelin just four times since his death typically performing with Bottom's son Jason on the drums in his father's place. Still, the allure of a partial reunion has always lurked. While Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones have both expressed interest in reuniting, Robert Plant has remained steadfast in his belief that the band died with Bonham. A frustrated Page told NME in 2014, everyone would love to play more concerts for the band. Plant's just playing games, and I'm fed up with it, to be honest with you. In a 2018 interview with Billboard, 
Jason Bonham shed more light on Plant's widely criticized decision to retire Led Zeppelin. As Bonham revealed to the outlet, Plant said to him, I loved your dad way too much. It's not disrespect to you. You know the stuff better than all of us, but it's not the same. I can't go out there and fake it. For his part, Jones felt wounded when his two bandmates collaborated as Page and Plant without him in the 1990s, even naming their album No Quarter after his most famous song. He told Mick Wall, It did hurt to have to deal with it. It was a great shame, particularly after all we'd been through together. Led Zeppelin's wild touring exploits and penchant for borrowing songs from blues artists are remembered just as often as their great tunes. In fact, they are still commonly presented as the poster child band for rock and roll excess. But while they certainly engaged in plenty of debauchery, the group's negative reputation isn't completely fair. When people say Led Zeppelin to you, what does the word mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> One of the greatest rock and roll bands in the world. After all, Led Zeppelin was hardly the only band living the sex, drugs, and rock and roll life or appropriating black music in the 1960s and 70s. For one, the Rolling Stones, who were guilty of the same behaviors, were widely celebrated. While Led Zeppelin was perpetually disparaged by the media, mothers, and critics alike, this confusing legacy led Plant to raise a valid question in a 2003 interview with Vanity Fair. How can we be reviled in so many different generations and then find out that we were people's favorite band? 